The New Testament reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 3 through 13. In the Pew Bible, New Testament is on page 174. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the work of miracle, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ruth, for being our reading today. We appreciate it. Thank you. When I first joined the Rotary Club in Charlotte, North Carolina, after I was called to my second pastorate, for the first time I encountered, in a formal manner, the philosophical and moral principle known as the common good. In Rotary, as in many other civic clubs, guest speakers and community leaders talked about the individual's role in creating and sustaining the common good. And they also talked about the role of what that group that was labeled corporate citizens. I'd never heard that term before until I did Rotary, corporate citizens. The term corporate citizen defined the obligation of the business community, regardless of size, to contribute to the welfare and the peace of the town, stating that contributing to the common good was not just a choice, but an obligation, and that for businesses, for the corporate world to contribute to the common good was just as serious as an individual's obligation to their citizenship. Later in my studies, I learned that the idea of the common good originated in Greek philosophy, outlined by Plato, and later clearly defined by Aristotle. Aristotle said that the common good constituted the good of individuals. As a natural result of that, the good of individuals consisted in human flourishing, which is the right and natural thing, according to Aristotle, for humans to do. Humans want to flourish, and they should. But Aristotle narrowly defined the community who benefited from the common good to male citizens. He excluded women, slaves, and non-citizens. In fact, he said they really had no part in the common good. In Judaism, of both the Old and New Testaments, the philosophy of the common good was encapsulated in a theological concept called Seneca. Seneca is the responsibility to give aid, assistance, and money to the poor and needy, or to worthwhile causes. But the word is much broader than the definition of just charity. The root word of Seneca 
means justice. And in later rabbinical teaching, Judaism viewed social welfare as an economic and social justice matter. Understanding property, understand property, property understood correctly requires that Seneca requires the donor to share his or her compassion and empathy along with the money. To quote Maimonides, perhaps the most famous of the medieval Judaic scholars, whoever gives to the poor with a sour expression and in a surly manner, even if he gives a thousand gold pieces, loses his merit. One should instead give cheerfully and joyfully, <clears throat> empathizing with him in his sorrow. Jesus of Nazareth clearly understood the Jewish concept of tzedakah and said that for his followers, it was a part of reflecting the unconditional love of God for humanity. Jesus was also severely critical of those religious leaders who failed to uphold the common good and openly confronted those leaders in their hypocrisy. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. <clears throat> it is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. Woe also to you, lawyers, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not lift a finger to ease them. Later on in the Gospels, Jesus answers the question, who is my neighbor? And do you remember what the answer was? It was the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in that parable, Jesus elevates the common good above law, religion, race, nationality, and any other boundary that limits one's ability to love others as God loves us. Jesus had a very, very broad view of the common good. And that was rare. That had never been seen in his time. Jesus' understanding of the common good as a reflection of the love of God is at the heart of this event that took place in Jerusalem after Christ's ascension that we celebrate today. The Jewish religious festival known as Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks commemorates the revelation of the Torah on Mount Sinai to Moses and then to the Jewish people. More importantly, in relation to Pentecost, it was one of the three pilgrimages, pilgrimage festivals that was held each year at the Jerusalem temple, meaning that those adherents to Judaism, the Jewish religion, and those who were sympathizers to the Jewish religion would travel from all over the world, every known corner of the world at that time, to Jerusalem to participate in those festivals. It was expected of them to do that. Jews and Jewish sympathizers would journey to the city. And what did they bring with them? They brought with them their differences. Differences in synagogue, differences in language, in community, in point of view, and differing religious practices within the Jewish religion. It was this lack of commonality between people who still shared a common spiritual belief that framed the birth of the Christian church at Pentecost. Today, Pentecost is celebrated in many parts of Christianity as kind of an insular event. According to this approach, the gift of the Holy Spirit was a gift that only affected 
followers of Christ for the purposes of their own belief or for the purpose of bringing others to their own belief. But in hearing our scripture lesson this morning from Paul's letter to the church of Corinth, Paul's approach to the Pentecost event encompasses not just belief in Jesus Christ, but the obligation of justice, compassion, and caring that the Holy Spirit empowers in believers. Paul writes, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. There's that phrase. Now what does Paul mean when he declares that the Holy Spirit has been given to each believer for the common good? In the 2,000 plus years of our existence, many Christians have interpreted the common good to be that of the church and the church alone. Their view is that the Holy Spirit works only toward creating a community of those who confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. In the Corinthian church to whom Paul is writing, the event of Pentecost had been interpreted even more narrowly within that church, within that congregation, as a sign of authenticity and separation. And that point of view is literally destroying the life of that congregation. The gifts of the Holy Spirit were seen by some of the leaders in Corinth as unique and miraculous affirmations that separated the faithless from the faithful within the Christian community. If one spoke in tongues, if one performed miracles, if one received healing, for them, they interpreted it as a sign of Christ's particular favor upon these individuals and declared that Christ loved them more than others in the church. Paul is clearly disturbed by this interpretation in the Corinthian congregation. That's why he writes the letter. As a righteous Jew who had embraced Jesus as the Messiah, Paul was familiar, certainly with the Greek philosophy of the common good, the Jewish understanding of Seneca, and Christ's teachings about the meaning of the word neighbor as relating to love for all creation. Paul would have been familiar with all three of those understandings. That is why his understanding of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that the Spirit supplies practical means, a practical means, of living out the Christian life. For what reason? to bring the kingdom of God to the world. The Spirit supplies a practical means of living out the Christian life for a purpose in order to bring the kingdom of God where? To the world. For Paul, the gift of the Holy Spirit was not an initiation into the church nor was it credentials for individual believers, but it was the means by which God's good purposes are empowered through the individual believer, through the community of faith, and to all of humanity. That's what that meant for Paul. It wasn't credentials. It wasn't an initiation into the church, but it was a means of empowering Christians to do their work in the world. Paul puts the exclamation point on his 
perspective. In the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, when he begins that chapter with, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. William Sloan Coffin, in his book, Living the Truth in a World of Illusion, restates Paul's message to the church of Corinth. As, as he speaks to our churches today, as the message speaks to our churches today, and this is what he says. Christians have no business thinking that the good life, Coffin means the moral life, consists mainly in not doing bad things. We have no business thinking that to do evil in this world, you have to be a Bengal tiger, when in fact, it is enough to be a tame tabby, a nice person, but not a good one. In short, Pentecost makes it clear that nothing is so fatal to Christianity as indifference. Think about that. Pentecost makes it clear that nothing is so fatal to Christianity as indifference. Indifference can destroy a church. It was destroying the Christian church of Corinth. As Coffin affirms, as much as the church needs to understand and appropriate the gifts of the spirit of Pentecost, we also need to understand the setting of where this event took place because it is important. And we'll remember that setting as revealed to us by Luke in the second chapter of Acts. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power? All were amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what does this mean? It is still appropriate for the church of Jesus Christ to ask the same question in light of the events in our time. What does Pentecost mean? What does Pentecost mean in a time of great unrest? And sadness. What does Pentecost mean during a worldwide pandemic? What does Pentecost mean in the cries for justice that we are hearing right now in connection with the killing of George Floyd? What does Pentecost mean in our own concern of safety for the first responders and those whom we task to keep the peace and protect our communities and our nation? I think Christianity's answer must center on the words of Paul to that divided and suffering church trying to live out its faith in a divided and suffering world. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. When we inconvenience ourselves, as I did a while ago, with masks and gloves. I didn't like that, trying to get that mask off. And with social distancing, and as we do these webcasts, with a more difficult way of being the church in the world, it is for the common good of God's creation. Not just at the dictates of politics or authorities, but for the sake of Christ's love and compassion for others. It is for 
the common good. Jesus died for the world and then sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost that we might live for the world in the name of Jesus Christ. When we stand for justice, we take on the pain and the suffering of our global neighborhood, but we do not inflict pain in order to prove ourselves right, nor do we hate those who do. We hate what they do in inflicting pain. We do. But we don't hate them because Christ died for them as well. We have witnessed this weekend the shocked voices of those who are standing for justice in our cities and streets, crying out with our community leaders, why are you doing this? As they have witnessed others turning compassion, their compassion, into violence and chaos and anarchy and looting and destruction. And those who want to stand for justice are going, and you see them. Why are you doing this? This is not what we came to do. We came to do the common good. The Holy Spirit at Pentecost came not to give us the power of God's final judgment, but to empower us to give God's love, which all followers of Christ have the right to give. In fact, it is the only thing we have the right to give, the love of Christ. Bishop N.T. Wright wrote these words in describing the challenge of Pentecost. You are called to be truly human, but it is nothing short of the life of God within you that enables you to be so, to be remade, in God's image. As C.S. Lewis said in a famous lecture, next to the sacrament itself, he meant communion, your Christian neighbor is the holiest object ever presented to your sight. And your neighbor is the holiest object ever presented to your sight. Because in him or her, the living Christ is truly present, the common good. We can understand Wright's words and this Pentecost Sunday in this way. Jesus did not die for a select few, but for a common humanity, and they are the ones for whom we've been given the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the church. They are of every race and every nation. They are every type of human being. They are sinners just like us. And we are to love them. Because like us, they are not worthy of the grace God gave to them in the death and resurrection of God's Messiah, Jesus. The Holy Spirit's greatest gift was the knowledge of common sin for which we are forgiven and the common good for which we can live. And that gift is the gift that keeps on giving. It's what makes us the church. So let us together be the gift of God's love for our neighborhood. And what is our neighborhood? Who is our neighbor? Well, it's not just West University here in the heart of Tucson. It's just not the city of Tucson, nor is it just the state of Arizona, nor is it just the United States of America, nor is it even the globe, the world. It is all of God's creation. That is our neighborhood. All of God's creation, from the smallest, to the greatest. That is our neighborhood. And God gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit through Christ that we may heal each other, this world, 
and creation for the common good. Let us pray. Lord, we come with humble hearts to humble ourselves before you. For we often don't work toward the common good, Lord. We wall ourselves off. We separate ourselves emotionally, physically sometimes, and mentally. Lord, help us by your spirit to be forgiven and then tasked with breaking down the walls between us and opening our hearts in love that the world will see that we are bringing them your love, your healing, and your hope. So let it be, Lord, through us. In your holy and precious name, we make this prayer, now and forevermore.